The Golden Bough, a study in comparative religion was released in 1890 by Sir James George Fraser. It is the anthropologist's major opus, and some editions have over 1,000 pages. The title is a reference to Virgil's epic poem The Aeneid, in which the hero, Aeneas, uses a golden branch to gain entry into Hades, the underworld. Though some of the text's claims have been refuted, Fraser's overall premise, that human civilizations have progressed from belief in magic to religion to science, has stood the test of time, and the book continues to inspire current literature and art. The Golden Bough's themes include humanity's relationship with mortality, shared tales across cultures and time periods, and the progressive transition from superstitious to scientific thought. There are four books in the work. The King of the Wood, the first book, examines mysticism, spirituality, and beliefs of heavenly forces in many human societies. The second book, Killing the God, examines myths and ancient traditions in which gods were slain, tortured, or enslaved. Book 3, The Scapegoat, delves at instances in which gods were voluntarily or unwillingly sacrificed for the welfare of their people. The Golden Bough is the fourth and final book in the series. It investigates the afterlife and the possibility of passing from this world to the next. The chapter begins with Fraser discussing a renowned picture of Aeneas' Golden Bough by the English painter William Turner. According to tradition, Aeneas entered the underworld near Lake Nemi in modern-day Italy. Fraser highlights the rich and lethal history of this location, as well as its connection to Diana, the Roman goddess of nature and the moon. Fraser recounts that each high priest, known as the King of the Wood, rose to power by assassinating the preceding priest-king. Fraser is curious as to why and how this practice came to be, as well as why priests were referred to as kings in ancient times. Such customs existed before the Romans invaded the area and imposed their codified rules upon it. Fraser relates this strange ceremony to mythological traditions in various societies throughout the world. Fraser sees a pattern of self-sacrifice while researching mythology at Cambridge University utilizing historical diaries and letters. For the collective well-being of the group, it became essential across societies spanning time and place to assassinate a revered leader. This pattern of sacrifice endured throughout the Middle East and Northern Europe for a long time. Fraser explores Nordic and Mediterranean myths in his quest to discover the cause of the priest of Nemi's death. He observes that many early people felt that an item of clothing or physical body could never be separated from the individual. Thus, as shown in Voodoo, bruising a person's stray hair or trimmed nails really harms that person. According to Fraser, persons who claim the capacity to injure, manipulate, or aid others through voodoo advanced in social status in numerous societies. These early voodoo practitioners rose through the ranks to become respected healers and later priests. They also became pharaohs who claimed immortality or rulers who instilled in their subjects the belief that they were celestial creatures. However, as he researches these tales further, Fraser learns that only a small percentage of people really assassinated their kings. A ruler's life was actually more of a representation of his reign on earth, as well as the leader's willingness to sacrifice their life in order to serve their people. The spectrum of phenomena that the magician priests claimed to be able to control developed with civilization. Agriculture, the weather, weddings, and personal encounters with the gods were all part of this. Fraser investigates the mythology behind several religious events. He is particularly intrigued by gods who arise in one religion and then in another, under a different name and with a few elements adjusted. Examples include Adonis, a beautiful lad who is described as a noble child in some tales but a demigod and the son of Aphrodite in others. Osiris, the Egyptian equivalent of the Greek deity Zeus, and Diana, the Roman goddess who is known as Artemis in Greece. Fraser analyzes what it means for a people to believe in magic, religion, or science in the last chapter. According to Fraser, the order imposed by magic is arbitrary, 
whereas knowledge of how the universe works comes from demonstrable observations and persistent reasoning. However, while science is the clearest and most strong kind of mind, another, future system of thought may supersede or better it. Fraser does have some misgivings about science's potential to safeguard the human race in apocalyptic situations, such as when the sun burns out. But, he says, people need not despair since this has been the normal path of events since the beginning. The Golden Bough's whole line of investigation stems from a single ceremonial practice described by Fraser in the book's early chapters. He says that in Italy, there is a woodland spot on the edge of Lake Nemi devoted to the remembrance of the Roman goddess Diana. According to legend, each Diana priest who protects the woodland, called as the king of the wood, obtained his post by slaying the priest who held the role before him. According to legend, the king of the wood was slain by an escaped slave who beat him to death with a golden limb plucked from a tree in the grove. Fraser was intrigued by various aspects of this practice. He was perplexed as to why the priest was referred to as a king, a practice he later discovered was rather frequent. Next, he pondered the likelihood that the priest would spend most of his time worrying about would-be assassins plotting to depose him. Finally, Fraser questioned why the golden bough was so vital to the ceremony and why it was assumed that the gold branch would always be accessible. Fraser's quest for additional information leads to a lengthy investigation of myths and beliefs from numerous civilizations. Fraser examines notions linked with magic and how magic evolved into religion for a long portion towards the beginning of his investigation. He demonstrates how monarchs were supposed to have magical abilities, and how that belief spread across the ancient world to become the idea of the king as a religious figure, often associated with a deity. Simultaneously, he investigates how trees, particularly oaks, came to carry special significance in agrarian civilizations. Following the establishment of the link between secular rulers and religion, Fraser examines the ways in which this relationship harmed those key figures. He goes into great detail about taboos, relying on a range of cultures to demonstrate that taboos exist both as primordial superstitions and as beliefs in sophisticated, cultured society. After describing banned activities and how they fit into the existing social order, Fraser includes instances of forbidden behaviors that became part of the social code, emphasizing on the taboos that limited the king's and or priest's actions. The debate then shifts to societies that practice the assassination of monarchs, so that their divine powers do not wither with age, and the assassination of holy plants. Fraser demonstrates how numerous deities in global religions have been linked to the agricultural cycle of life and death by tying in mythology related to Diana's narrative, such as those involving Adonis, Attis, Osiris, Demeter and Persephone. Each of these myths involves an important figure who is associated with the growth cycle, a figure who dies or is stolen away to the underworld but is then allowed to return to the earth for limited periods of time, illustrating the idea that God's deaths are not catastrophic, but rather considered to be part of the natural process. Fraser investigates many ways of sacrifice throughout history and across cultures, such as ritual slaughter of holy animals to honor gods or symbolically eliminating evil. This conversation explores the notion of the scapegoat, which was initially a goat meant to represent evil but subsequently evolved into a human being who represented evil and was slain for the same reason. Fraser combines gold, the sun, fire, and power in his theory of why the golden bough is so crucial to the succession of the king of the wood. Trees struck by lightning, for example, were typically regarded as exceptionally noteworthy since they were supposed to contain even more fire than regular trees burnt for fuel. Fraser hypothesizes that the golden bough is an ancient term for mistletoe, which grows as a vine on oak trees, turns yellow or golden while the rest of the tree stays green, and is regarded to have mystical characteristics in various cultures. Connecting the magical abilities of monarchs to the magical powers of mistletoe, Fraser distinguishes between the belief that a person's soul could be placed in an object for safekeeping and the belief that important people could only be killed by something that was already a part of them, thus, if the power of the king of the wood was already in the mistletoe, 
the bow would be the only thing required to kill him. Fraser returns to the topic of why the priest of Diana must be murdered and by the specific prescribed way in the last two chapters. According to him, one conclusion to be drawn from this investigation is that the process of civilization leads from a primordial belief in magic, to a more organized belief in religion and, finally, to a belief in science.